Hello, and welcome to this conversation about uh, anti-Semitism with Eli Kohanim, the Assistant Envoy uh, for a Special Envoy to monitor and combat anti-Semitism. Uh, she was appointed by President Trump uh, to an institution that has existed for several years. Uh, the belief or behavior of hostility towards Jews, uh, just because they are Jewish, uh, has existed for uh, a long time. Uh, it can take the form of religious teachings that proclaim the inferiority of Jews or political efforts to isolate, oppress, or otherwise injure them. Uh, it may also include prejudiced or stereotyped views about Jews. It has been an attitude that has led to pogroms uh, and laws targeting Jews in Europe. And of course, we all remember the Holocaust in which 6 million Jews were killed by Nazis between 1941 and 1945 in Europe. Uh, for half a century after World War II, uh, public anti-Semitism became less pronounced and frequent in the Western world. Uh, stereotypes about Jews endured, uh, but Jews faced little physical danger in Western countries. Unfortunately, that is changing, and there, have been, there has been a resumption of attacks on Jews, even in European nations and the United States. A disagreement over policy toward the state of Israel has created an opportunity in which the expression Zionist, which is support for Israel as the Jewish homeland, is often used as an anti-Semitic code word for Jews in mainstream debate. Holocaust denial and attempts to rewrite histories such as the false claim that Jews control the Atlantic slave trade uh, and other lies. Uh, 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 suggesting uh, that the Jews were to blame for their own, uh, 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 for the tragedies that befell them. Uh, these are definitely around, and we see them surfacing even in uh, academic discussions. But the center of anti Semitism now is less the West and more the greater Middle East. Uh, Jews were driven out of the Arab countries uh, in the 1940s and 50s, uh, and from Iran and Turkey as well. Since 1979, Iran's revolutionary regime has become a major promoter of anti-Semitism. Uh, today in this conversation, uh, we couldn't have a better speaker. Uh, our, my, my colleague in this conversation is uh, Eli Kohanim, who is the Assistant Special Envoy to monitor and combat anti-Semitism. Welcome on behalf of the Hudson Institute, Eli. Thank you, Ambassador Haqqani. Um, uh, yeah, why don't we start with a few opening remarks from you and then we go forward. Wonderful. Um, before I, I start my formal remarks, Ambassador, I just want to um, thank the Hudson Institute for this inv invitation. Um, you know, the Hudson Institute, I find, is a true thought leader on the most pressing issues of our day. And so it's really my pleasure to join you and to join the Hudson Institute for this conversation. Um, as you mentioned, Ambassador, in your very kind introduction, I was appointed to the State Department in November of 2019 as Assistant Special Envoy to monitor and combat anti-Semitism. This office at the State Department was created by a bipartisan act of Congress in 2004 under President George W. Bush. What is new is that under our present administration, for the first time, uh, we have been given the resources and the staffing such that I've joined, as well as two others in a kind of deputy level positions. And what that allows us is the ability to take a deep regional approach to the fight against anti-Semitism. And I would tell you that's very much to the credit, credit of uh, President Trump and Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, who understand the threat that anti-Semitism um, presents to the world. So um, in my work, I am dealing mostly with the Middle East, North Africa, and Latin America regions. And um, what you'll note uh, about what brings those regions together, what kind of ties those two regions is the Islamic Republic of Iran. And, and that's, uh, that's a topic that I hope we'll explore together in, in, uh, in depth today. Um, and um, so, you know, Ambassador, I think you did a fantastic job of explaining some of the history of anti-Semitism and where we are today. So I wanna share with you some st statistics on where we are today. 
Uh, the Cantor Center out of Tel Aviv University recently published a report. And what they showed was that there were 456 violent anti-Semitic attacks on Jews worldwide in 2019, which was an 18% increase from the year before that. And it was unfortunately the largest annual increase since 2014. So, um, you know, that's, that's kind of the state of anti-Semitism where Jews are finding themselves the victims of violent physical attacks worldwide. What we have found in our office is that there are three primary sources for this hatred towards Jews. The first comes from the radical right wing white supremacist neo-Nazi camp, which engage in what's called classical anti-Semitism. The second source of this hatred is coming from the far left camp, and where they're expressing their anti-Semitism as anti-Zionism, something that you noted as well. And um, often this source of anti-Semitism is being called the new anti-Semitism. And finally, the last source of hatred towards Jews is emanating from the militant Islamic world. Um, what we do in our work in the Special Envoys Office is that we don't rank nor minimize these uh, sources of hatred. And what we know is that Jewish people worldwide are finding themselves the victims of all three of these forms of hatred coming at them at the same time. When it comes to radical Islamic anti-Semitism, which is what plagues the Middle East and North Africa, as you mentioned, Ambassador, um, what we find in those societies is that anti-Semitism is institutionalized in the very fabric of society, such that children are being taught uh, the most vile anti-Semitic stereotypes in their very curricula, in the education system, we also find that there are certain mosques in the region where the imams are preaching uh, just the most awful anti-Semitic thoughts. And finally, um, we find that there is a fair amount of anti-Semitism in the media. And so what that does, again, is that it creates um, an institutionalized form of anti-Semitism so that whether you're a child or, or an adult, you're being exposed to this, uh, to this messaging almost in every space that you're going through. And somewhere along the way, you're going to pick this up. And so it's a serious issue. Um, I thought there was two... Um, two ideas that could help us frame this conversation today. So um, I wanted to uh, refer to a 1995 piece in Commentary Magazine written by Martin Kramer. And Kramer discusses Israel's response to Hezbollah attacks. Specifically, he states, and I'm going to quote, Israel's policy has been to signal that when Hezbollah attacks Israelis, Israel will invariably respond. But when it attacks Jews elsewhere, it must not reckon with Israel, but with the world, unquote. For me, Martin Kramer's question about uh, if it's true that Israel does not respond to attacks on Jews, not her citizens, what that does is it de facto puts the moral responsibility to respond to attacks on Jews from radical forces on other governments. I would argue that the United States today, certainly under President Trump and the Trump administration, rises to the challenge of combating anti-Semitism clearly and vigorously, and uh, wherever it raises its ugly head. The second notion I thought would be helpful in framing this conversation was uh, a piece that came from CIA veteran Raoul Marc Gerecht, who in 2015 said, and I quote, Read through State Department telegrams and Central Intelligence Agency operational and intelligence cables on the Middle East, and you'll seldom find anti-Semitism discussed, even though Jew hatred, not just anti-Zionism, has been a significant aspect, if not a core component, of modern Arab nationalism, Islamic fundamentalism, and what usually passes for critical thought among sophisticated Arab elites." Unquote. What I find is that Gerecht is posing a scathing accusation here directly at the United States State Department and our intelligence agencies in this 2015 quote. Question is, do we notice the anti-Semitism that's emanating from the Middle East and the Muslim world, much less are we doing something about it? 
And here again, I would posit that this president and this administration has um, pioneered and implemented the most effective uh, three-pronged strategy for combating anti-Semitism worldwide. And the strategy is as follows. First, the United States has launched the, um, the strongest sanctions regime ever in the history of the United States against the number one state sponsor of anti-Semitism in the world, and that is the radical Islamic regime in Iran. Um, our sanctions have demonstrably weakened Iran. We've also weakened Iran's ability to fund its proxies. So whether that's Hezbollah, whether that's the Houthis in Yemen, and we've also hampered the regime's ability to spread their hatred worldwide. The second prong of our strategy against anti-Semitism is the president's vision for peace. And what the vision for peace calls for is normalization between the Gulf Arab countries, between Jordan, Egypt, and, and all the con neighboring countries of the Jewish state of Israel. And um, you know, I think that all of us are, are living through this historic moment right now where the peace deal that the United States brokered between Israel and the United Arab Emirates is unfolding before our eyes right now as we speak. So uh, this historic peace deal was just announced last week. We have uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, who was just traveling through the region. We have the special advisor to the president, Jared Kushner, uh, taking the first commercial flight between Israel and the United Arab Emirates just today. And so, uh, and we have the UAE announcing just this past weekend that they have formally uh, ended their 1972 boycott of Israel. So what we're finding is that indeed this Gulf Arab state has normalized relations with Israel. We're finding that uh, that Israel's Arab neighbors are more and more normalizing relations. They're more and more accepting that Israel is here to stay. And so what that does is that it, um, we know that normalization and acceptance of Israel automatically leads to a lessening of anti-Semitism in the region. The final note I wanna make on, on the region is that this administration as policy has stated that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism full stop. So that what we don't do is we don't distinguish between those who hate Jews and those who merely hate the Jewish state. And the last prong of our uh, anti-Semitism policy has been to, to stand shoulder to shoulder with Jewish populations all over the world and truly demand that governments everywhere provide for the safety and security of their Jewish communities. It's our feeling that uh, the security of Jews for any given government is their responsibility and it's not a favor that they do for their Jewish population and, and that's something that we advocate very strongly everywhere. And uh, so Ambassador, that is our three-pronged uh, anti-Semitism strategy and uh, I look forward to your thoughts and questions. Thank you very much. Now let me begin by saying that you know most uh, State Department uh, bureaus uh, and, and uh, sort of functional uh, 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 departments they, they divide things geographically in a kind of a contiguous manner. So, for example, the Middle East and North Africa, or for a long time, what was known as the Near East and South Asia, because they join each other on the map. In your case, uh, your responsibilities are Latin America, Middle East and North Africa. So basically, uh, the heart of the Muslim world, and then Latin America. Um, I thought about it. And I thought that maybe the connection is because there is actually a connection in the anti-Semitism or the manifestations of anti-Semitism in Latin America and the Middle East. Explain that to us. Sure. Uh, so I think that's a, an astute observation, Ambassador, and, and I'm not surprised given your own, uh, you know, history and, and, and all of the scholarship that you have already out there there on this field. Um, so Ambassador, I, I mentioned earlier that Iran is kind of a link between the Middle East uh, region and Latin America. And so where you specifically see that is the Iranian penetration in Venezuela, unfortunately. So, um, you know, those two uh, very uh, troubled countries are tied together right now. They're both kind of um, a lifeline. These two despotic regimes, which are each oppressing their own people, are uh, tied together. What I'm hearing from the 
Venezuelan Jewish community is that, um, you know, in Venezuela, there's really no interest naturally among their citizens in issues of Israel and the Palestinians, and yet they are being bombarded with things like posters and billboards on the highways that are presenting the Israelis as, uh, as an apartheid state and other, you know, flies like that, which are in essence trying to brainwash and influence the Venezuelan population. This is all being directly linked to the Iranian regime and Iran's ties to Venezuela. So in this case, you have a very clear example of Iran's exportation of its own messaging to a country that has no natural interest to the Middle East conflicts and really trying to influence public opinion in Venezuela. Um, in other parts of Latin America, you've got the tri-border area of Argentina, Brazil, and Uruguay, which um, has heavy, heavy Hezbollah activity. Now, again, Hezbollah is a creation of Iran. It's a proxy of Iran. It's heavily funded by Iran. And what's happening in the tri-border state areas is that uh, it's, a, it's a hub of narco-trafficking. It's a hub of money laundering and um, how it presents a danger to the Jewish people and anti-Semitism. Well, well, if you recall the AMIA attack, the attack that Hezbollah carried out on the Jewish community center in Argentina in 94 was the deadliest anti-Semitic attack on Jews in the Americas since World War II. So again, you have to really think about that. What does that mean? It's the deadliest. We've had 120, over 120 uh, people died in that attack and thousands more injured. So as much as unfortunately, Ambassador, we are seeing a rise in anti-Semitism here in the United States, I can say that it's a blessing that we've never seen anything like the Hezbollah attack. And, and you know, it's something that we in the United States will never forget. Uh, we has Argentina been uh, sufficiently supportive of efforts to try and exclude Hezbollah from uh, and, and stop potentially future, uh, sort of similar attacks in future? Well, we want to um, certainly credit Argentina for last year designating Hezbollah as a, as a terrorist entity in its entirety, and again, doing so this year. Um, so we, again, we applaud Argentina for doing that. And uh, we really applaud every country that has done so recently. So that includes Lithuania and Germany most recently. And uh, Ambassador, I would tell you that the designation of Hezbollah as a terrorist organization is one of our administration's priorities. We call on every nation to do so. Okay, now let's move to the region in which Hezbollah operates because it operates in a context. Uh, the Jewish communities of Syria, uh, Iraq, uh, were primarily uh, uh, thrown out, pushed out, expelled, forced out, made into refugees, and live in, in, in primarily in Israel. Libya, the same, so these are troubled spots. But there's another troubled spot, and that is Yemen which has had a significant Jewish population, a very historic Jewish population that has existed uh, for millennia. Uh, what is happening in Yemen in the course of the civil war? Uh, how safe is the Jewish population there? Uh, extremist activity has been very high uh, from both the Sunni extremists of the Al-Qaeda variety and the Shia extremists of the pro-Iran Houthi variety. So how are Jews faring in Yemen and what is the state of anti-Semitism there? What is the U.S. able to do to help the embattled community there, as well as to put pressure on the various parties to make sure that they do not conduct a, uh, a, a massive pogrom of Jews there? Yeah, Ambassador, uh, thank you for bringing up, I think, a subject that's been long neglected in, uh, in understanding of the region, and that's the Jewish presence that uh, in the Middle East and North Africa. So if I can kind of take back the, the subject just to its history, um, you know, the Jewish people are indigenous to the Middle East, North Africa region. And so in each of those countries that you mentioned, uh, the Jewish presence predates the Islamic conquest. So you're talking about 
people whose ties to the region go back thousands and thousands of years, including my own family. I was born in Iran myself. And uh, the Persian Jewish community dates back to the first temple period. So again, this is a community that's been, that had been living in ancient Persia prior to the rise of Christianity and, and then prior to the rise of, of later Islam. So uh, the ties to this region are deep. And I can tell you that um, for Jews, whether it's someone like myself who was born there or people of, of my parents' generation or the grandparents' generation who had to flee our homeland, um, our, you know, for many people, our hearts are still in that region. We very much feel for our brothers and sisters who in, in many of those countries that you mentioned, Syria, Iraq, Yemen, Iran, either they're under uh, oppressive regimes or they're in countries that are in just catastrophic conditions because of government neglect and uh, and civil wars and so on and so again you know for the jewish people who who come from this region our hearts are very much there and we and we feel for our brothers and sisters that are still there and and in many cases we, i think the jews feel that uh this story has been neglected it's untold and and there is still more work to be done in terms of of getting the story out um, Ambassador, regarding the question of, of Yemen specifically that you mentioned, so in fact the Houthis, uh, the Houthi militias who have kind of run amok there, uh, and they are an Iran proxy, um, they have a horrible, horrible human rights record there against the very small Jewish community that's still there, but also against the Baha'is and other religious minorities. Um, at the moment, there is one Jewish man who has been imprisoned by the Houthis for over four years, and our office uh, has recently called for his release, and we will continue to call for his release. He's being held there uh, for no good reason, and it's time for the Houthis to release him. Now, in the international community, and of course, uh, one knows the, 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 the diplomatic uh, circumstances, it's a good thing that the United Arab Emirates has taken the bold step. Uh, Prince uh, Mohammed bin Zayed deserves full credit for, for, for being bold enough and courageous enough to take the first step in recognizing Israel. Uh, there are still about 32 countries in the world that do not recognize the state of Israel, um, all of them Muslim countries. Um, and the United Nations has so far uh, not adopted a uniform definition of anti-Semitism that can be uh, that can be the uh, sort of the guiding light for how governments deal with this uh, ancient hatred. Um, what is the U.S. government and your department, uh, uh, your bureau, doing to deal with this? Well, I would tell you that um, adopting the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism, what's often referred to as the IRA definition, has been a priority of our office, the anti-Semitism office. And uh, just to share with you, the State Department adopted the IRA definition back in 2010. President Trump, in uh, issuing the executive order combating anti Semitism of December 2019, adopted the IRA definition for all of our executive agencies. So now the United States executive agencies have all also adopted the IRA definition. Where there is some controversy on this universally accepted definition is that the IRA definition um, underneath the, the proper definition has 26 or so examples of what anti-Semitism is. And some of those examples touch upon anti-Zionism and the Jewish state and the Jewish people's right to sovereignty in essence. And so that's where I think you have bodies like the UN and others who are kind of resistant to this definition. We we have called over and over again for all countries, for the UN, for all multilateral bodies to accept this IRA definition. And it really does help in trying to understand where speech and actions have crossed the line into anti Semitism. Well, uh, uh, I, uh, you know, we, we spoke about earlier, and you, you really mentioned all the various categories. So you talk, talk about uh, the white supremacist uh, uh, sort of anti-Semitism. Uh, I know it's not your uh, specific area, but I think it is connected. And then there is the rise of or a, rev a revival of anti-Semitism in Europe, uh, especially France, where 
uh, Jewish graves have been desecrated, synagogues have been attacked. Um, do you see a connection, at least in Europe, uh, between so Middle Eastern anti-Semitism and the European anti-Semitism, meaning that as more communities have a inflow from the Middle East, perhaps that reignites and then uh, white supremacists uh, as well as far left anti-Semites uh, sort of let the religious anti-Semitism be the front while they operate in the back. Has there been any observation of that trend? So um, what I would tell you is that there, there is statistical uh, information to back up this question, which is that indeed with the migration of peoples from the Middle East to Europe and to the West comes the migration of anti-Semitic attitudes. So that, uh, you know, what we spoke about earlier in the conversation about the institutionalized anti-Semitism that people might have uh, in vibed in the Middle East, they will unfortunately naturally take those attitudes with them wherever they go. And so, so it is a challenge uh, for European governments to figure out exactly how they're going to deal with the integration of immigrants that are coming to their shores with these, uh, you know, hateful attitudes and what they're going to do about that. Um, I would say also uh, your question about um, does, you know, what, what I heard you say, Ambassador, is does the rise in immigration from the Middle East to Europe somehow also lead to a response from the radical white supremacists in Europe? And, and certainly, I, I think, again, the facts bear out that indeed there is a backlash against these European open borders policies. And so, again, what that does is that it behooves the center, it behooves the European center parties to try to figure out how they're going to deal with these issues of immigration. What I would posit is that for them to pretend that these problems don't exist, the problems that have come along with, with migration, is, is it's, it's a terrible policy because there is indeed a backlash. There are people who are concerned for numerous reasons about this migration onto Europe. And so again, it behooves the, the center par, par, um, sorry, parties in Europe to figure out how they're going to deal with migration in a responsible manner such that they can control the backlash and control also any of the racist, anti-Semitic, anti-LGBTQ, uh, misogynist attitudes that some populations might be bringing with them to their shores. Well, uh, my question actually had was two-pronged. One, one part was, of course, that uh, the uh, presence of anti-Semitic uh, sort of migrants also allows the anti-Semitic old populations to remanifest their uh, hardcore beliefs that had been kind of suppressed in the 50 years immediately after the Second World War when the memory of the Holocaust was uh, very fresh and people thought, no, 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 we can't let this happen. So obviously we have seen both uh, migrant anti-Semitism, but also a revival of white supremacist anti-Semitism in the West. Yeah, so I don't know that we can pin the the increase in white supremacist, neo-Nazi anti-Semitism on anything other than that uh, there's just in some sense, I think, a loss of historic memory. Um, there's a loss of historic memory. It's possible that these Western uh, societies are not doing a good enough job to to you know keep the memory of of the Holocaust alive for their Jew for their populations. So that um, probably another message that I think is getting lost is is the effects that anti-Semitism has on society. So, Ambassador, you know, if you look historically at every country where anti-Semitism was allowed to flourish, um, eventually the society as a whole gets, you know, it become, becomes at the brunt of the punishment so that, you know, the entire society eventually falls into decay. 
Anti-Semitism is often, it's the canary in the coal mine. It's the first sign that something is going awry and eventually the society pays for it as a whole. And I think for the Europeans, uh, you know, what happened just 75 years ago with the Nazi murder of 6 million Jews on that continent. Um, well, you know, we all know that, that it didn't start and end with the murder of the 6 million Jews. There were 11 million people murdered in total. The entire continent of Europe was decimated. Um, you had the rise of fascism and communism come out of that. And so, you know, this, and to this day, I think the Europeans are really kind of still suffering the consequences of the fact that they failed to stop this hatred of the Jews when it first started on their shores. So, so indeed, I think that, again, it's, it becomes incumbent on responsible actors in Europe to really gain hold of, uh, of any rising hate that they're finding on their on their land and um, ambassador i just want to say that to that point you know there's a lot that we advocate for in our bilateral relationships so adopting the ira definition is one of them designating hezbollah as a terror organization is one of them providing for security for jewish communities is one of them making sure that they have strong hate uh, laws on the books is one of them, and enforcing their hate laws is the other. So there's a lot that governments can do, and there's a lot that uh, that responsible actors can do. If I may, I also want to comment for one moment on uh, on on something that I think is an interesting case study. Um, if you look most recently at the um, the Islamic Relief Worldwide Organization. So this is a, an Islamic charity that over the last 10 years has collected almost 1 billion euros. Again, I wanna, I wanna make note of that, over almost 1 billion euros in donations from the United Nations and governments throughout Europe. And what we just saw in the news recently is that uh, first we had the executive director of the organization stepped down because there were Facebook posts of his revealed in which he called Jews the children of apes and pigs. Uh, so this man was uh, was forced to step down when this revelation came in. There was another uh, acting director who came in and, and a board of others who run this organization. Well, just in the last week, it was revealed again that all five of these people who are running this charity have indulged in pro-terrorist and anti-Semitic uh, um, activities and, and uh, social media posts and so on. And so now the entire uh, leadership has been forced to step down. I have to ask myself, uh, the person who was very instrumental in revealing this anti-Semitic uh, hatred was uh, Lorenzo Vidino, who is director of the extremism program of GW, and I know someone that the Hudson Institute has hosted and has relationship with as well. And so what I have to ask myself is if someone at, uh, at a center for extremism at a U.S. university can expose this, if he can find this information. How is it that the United Nations and these governments in Europe couldn't? A little bit hard to believe. So I think again, Ambassador, to your question, it is very much incumbent upon European governments to take the issue of anti-Semitism seriously and to really think about when they're funding organizations to the tunes of millions upon millions of dollars to really making sure that those dollars are being spent responsibly. Well, there's an unwillingness uh, in, among Western governments to actually crack down on radical Islamist groups such as the Muslim Brotherhood and its analog parties from other parts of the world, many of whom carry these anti-Semitic beliefs uh, deeply, but have taken advantage of uh, sort of uh, modern and Western institutions to create these massive charities and other organizations, networks of schools, um, which transpose the hatred uh, that has been cultivated in the greater Middle East back to Europe and the United States and Canada. And, uh, and, and I think that uh, your job is actually uh, a much bigger job, uh, the, the office uh, that you're associated with. Uh, I know that Elan um, uh, Carr, uh, the special envoy, uh, has talked about it that actually this needs not only expanded resources, but expanded uh, uh, commitment. Uh, and, uh, and so let us hear from you, uh, what actually does your work entail on a day-to-day -day basis? I mean, people would be interested in giving in, in examples. Yes, we understand that it's about monitoring 
anti-Semitism. Several non-governmental organizations do that too. Uh, how far is the United States willing to put its might behind combating anti-Semitism? Uh, well, Ambassador, I would tell you again that uh, the United States, we're very fortunate right now uh, under the present administration because no one has taken this, the threat of global anti-Semitism more seriously than, than the president, the secretary of state. And, uh, you know, they themselves, as I mentioned, have, have put in so much of their own efforts in this fight. So uh, whether it is the president's executive order combating anti-Semitism, which was issued in December, um, that EO, for those who may not know, for the first time in American history, um, extended Title VI protection to American Jews. And a lot of that was, uh, was in response to the anti-Semitism that American Jewish students on college campuses are facing. And that too, uh, Ambassador, is about anti-Zionism and, and these uh, horrible accusations that are made against Israel on, on our own campuses. And ultimately what happens is that Jewish students are finding themselves the target of a lot of hatred on our campuses and this executive order for the first time as I said gives Jewish students protection that they never had historically before that um, and again you know in terms of the global stage what what the administration has done is that we've taken on Iran we've taken on terror organizations we've taken on all of the most hostile actors who are spreading anti-Semitism both uh, in messages, but also in their in their kinetic activity and in in all of their activity worldwide. If I may stay on on Iran for a moment, Ambassador, um, and you know the reason why Iran is considered the number one state sponsor of anti-Semitism is that they have an almost. I was going to come to Iran in a bit. Yeah. Great. Go ahead. So, um, you know, Iran's anti-Semitism is, is an obsessive kind of anti-Semitism, which is that uh, they daily are calling for the elimination of the Jewish state of Israel off the face of the earth. They're, they chant uh, death to Israel all the time. You have uh, this going all the way from the top, from the supreme leader, Ali Khamenei, the Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, who um, recently put out a poster, for example, which uh, echoes Hitler's final solution. The poster literally has the words, the final solution on it. And what this poster depicts is a Jerusalem that is Judenrein. Um, you know, it, again, it, it shows this fantasy that the Iranian regime has of taking over Jerusalem and pretty much, uh, you know, freeing it from the Jews. Um, and and you, he has used Twitter to uh, tweet out a 14-point plan for eliminating Israel. He has used Twitter for, for really putting out a lot of hate towards the Jewish people. And um, this, is, this is kind of like an obsessive anti-Semitism that motivates them in everything that they do. So even their uh, proxy activity that we spoke about earlier, uh, Hezbollah, Hamas, the Houthis, you know, all of this is aimed at Jewish civilians and Israelis. Um, and so the the United States has really um, taken on Iran in a way that no administration prior did. One thing I would tell you, President Trump has said over and over again, is that as long as he's president, the Iranians are not going to have a nuclear bomb. Um, so if you understand that Iran presents an existential threat to the Jewish state of Israel, if we understand that Israel right now houses, uh, Israel and the United States house the two largest Jewish populations in the world. And so when one country is threatening genocide against uh, half the Jewish population, and then you have a United States of America president saying, well, he's just not going to allow that to happen. You know, that that is, I think, as strong a policy against anti-Semitism as there could be. The other uh, question that we're facing right now in the world um, is the issue of the UN embargo of conventional weapons for Iran. So right this moment, our European allies are contemplating whether they should allow the Iranians to have access to advanced military uh, weapons. 
And uh, you know, that would mean that they would be able to buy and sell this advanced conventional weaponry. And again, you know, here we are only 75 years after the, the chimneys of, of Auschwitz have cooled and the crematoria have cooled where 6 million Jews were, were murdered on European soil. And we have the Europeans only 75 years later contemplating possibly arming this regime, which calls for the elimination of the one and only Jewish state. So I think that, that there's a lot of uh, questions, uh, moral questions that our European allies need to be asking themselves right now. And Iran's behavior, of course, needs to be challenged by its own neighbors. And uh, uh, if, uh, even if it is for different reasons, uh, I think that it uh, would uh, require a kind of a containment policy towards Iran in which the mullahs are not allowed to spread uh, their doctrines of hate, uh, their violence, uh, and their willingness uh, to sort of uh, burn the entire region down uh, as if because it does not follow what they want to believe or follow. Uh, so Iran does remain a major problem. Um, I was going to ask that question, but I'm glad that you answered it before I could ask it. Turkey is another country in the region uh, that is slowly becoming problematic. I don't know if in the geographic division uh, uh, within the office of the special envoy uh, that falls under your purview, but I would still like you to say something because President Erdogan has definitely uh, reignited anti-Semitic tropes uh, in Turkey and has also been fueling uh, sort of uh, anti-Semitism elsewhere by supporting groups like the Muslim Brotherhood. Indeed. So um, we, we are seeing uh, that kind of activity coming out of Turkey. I would tell you that the Jewish population in, in Iran and Turkey are the, the two largest populations left in the region. Um, and we have a very close eye out on the Turkish Jewish community. Um, at the moment, you know, they are uh, still living, uh, I would say, very quietly and under the radar in Turkey. And uh, certainly we're not pleased by some of the anti-Semitic tropes that, uh, you know, Erdogan has, has uh, trafficked in. Um, and, you know, What's interesting for me is that I can't help but notice that uh, I think with the 1979 revolution in Iran and this kind of a dream of, a, of an Islamic, a radical Islamic republic uh, that, that the Khomeiniists kind of ignited in the region, you know, only so many years later, you have a country like Turkey, which, which was so proudly a secular Muslim country, and I think a, a potential role model for the region, um, suddenly kind of taking a turn for, for some, you know, more radicalized elements. Um, you know, we still have hope that, uh, that Turkey as a NATO country um, and, and an important, you know, player in the region will find its way um, towards maintaining, a, you know, a fair and democratic and, and uh, strong human rights uh, system for its citizens. Okay, um, coronavirus aftermath. Uh, everybody's looking at the world after coronavirus. So, you know, we might even end up like they used to be sort of before Christ, after Christ. We, we might actually end up having a new calendar someday uh, before coronavirus, after coronavirus. So the coronavirus has also brought in anti new anti-Semitic uh, tropes. Uh, how do you see them playing out in the world and how much of a danger are they uh, to the Jewish community and to the understanding of all of us about anti-Semitism. So uh, very sadly, the coronavirus indeed became an opportunity for, uh, for the hate mongers. Um, what happened when the virus came out was that we saw um, forces either um, spreading conspiracy theories that Israel or the Jews somehow created the virus or that they were going to somehow profit from the virus. Uh, you know, no matter that we know this virus emanated from Wuhan, China. Um, What's interesting to note, unfortunately, was that a lot of this conspiracy theory emanated from government officials as well. So we saw that coming out of the Palestinian Authority. Uh, indeed, from Turkey, we saw some of that. And um, in fact, Iran. Iran as well. I didn't want to become a, a <laughs> I didn't want to become a broken record on Iran. Yes, but the Iranians as well. In fact, uh, the Ayatollah Khamenei um, tweeted uh, tweeted. Um, 
a tweet in which he uses hashtag COVID-48. So what that referred to is uh, 1948, the year that Israel was created and the COVID virus, he, you know, he put these two things together. And so, you know, we all know that what you need to do with the coronavirus is you need to wipe it out. And so obviously he was, you know, again, advocating for the wiping out of Israel with this COVID-48 hashtag. Um, and it, it's a sad shame that people would use a pandemic as, uh, uh, as an opportunity to spread hatred of Jews. Um, Ambassador, you also will have to ask yourself, you know, when there is this scapegoating of, of Jews, who, who benefits from this? So I think in the old paradigm, again, in the Middle East, North Africa region, was that a lot of governments used to engage in the scapegoating of Jews, the scapegoating of Israel as a way to turn their population's eyes away from their own uh, issues and problems. And certainly in Iran, I think that is very much what's going on. The regime thinks that by scapegoating uh, Israel, by scapegoating the Jewish people, they're going to somehow fool their people into uh, not recognizing the tremendous problems that they have in their own society and also the regime's failure to really address the pandemic in, in, a, in a strong way. Um, and so, you know, what I think um, some of our government's policy have exposed is that those lies just don't work any longer. And, and the best example I can give of that is when President Trump moved the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem, at the time he was getting calls left and right from world leaders who were in essence telling him that the Arab street was going to go crazy. You know, we were going to see World War III start because the U.S. Embassy was going to be moved to the, to the Israeli capital. In fact, not only did we not see that, again, I think what the president's move did was it exposed all the lies, which is that the Arab street is no longer buying it. You know, they're not buying the scapegoating of Israel and the Jews for, for the problems that they have internally. And, uh, and the normalization that we're seeing with Israel, I think also is a recognition from many uh, governments in the region that they are on the same side with Israel. You know, to your question earlier about ISIS, Leading Iran. I think that Israel's neighbors, uh, certainly the Gulf Arab countries, they all recognize that Iran is the threat in the region. And uh, they're willing now to more openly work with Israel and work together to counter that shared threat. I think we've had a quite a comprehensive conversation on uh, the rising uh, anti-Semitism in the greater Middle East, the revival of anti-Semitism uh, in uh, uh, Europe, uh, the tentacles of anti-Semitism that spread from Tehran all the way to Buenos Aires and Caracas. Uh, and of course, uh, always important to remind people that uh, hate uh, consumes uh, the hater as much as it uh, hurts the hated, in fact, more. Uh, so let us hope that you, uh, uh, your uh, uh, office, uh, Special Envoy Alain Carr, and uh, the United States government in general succeed in this great effort to try and combat anti-Semitism. Thank you very much, Eli Kohanim, for joining us today. Thank you, Ambassador.